this channel by subscribing and leaving comments. Okay, sitting here with Al Hodgkins. Want to go back over the day Patterson come to tell him about the film, maybe what led up to it. So Al, if you'll go ahead and tell us about that day, you just go right on ahead. Okay, well, first off, uh, Renee, I'd like to say hello to you. and uh, uh, Good to know you all these years. Uh, sorry to hear you're in ill health, but uh, hope that uh, things turn out better for you. Uh, it, uh, going back to Patterson, uh, Patterson called me from uh, in front of our store uh, uh, shortly after six o'clock on that the night he got the on the day he got the film. I I, I had just closed the store and went home. Uh, we were going to have a picnic out in the backyard that night or a wiener roast, I mean, because it was getting late in the season and we figured it'd be the last time when the boys are were still small and. We would uh, have a little bonfire and roast the wieners and stuff. And, and uh, my wife come out and said, uh, Roger's on the phone, wants to talk to you. So I went in and answered the phone. He said, the first thing I heard, he said, Al, I got a picture of the son of a buck. And uh, he, I said, well, where are you at? He said, uh, I'm down in front of your store. And. Uh, there's a phone booth right in front of the store, and he was right down in front of the store. So he came down, and uh, or either, rather, he asked me if I'd come down. I said absolutely. Uh, and so I hired my wife and told her to get the boys, and <coughs> excuse me, in the uh, car, and let uh, uh, Roger get a picture of, of Bigfoot, and uh, let's go down and talk to him. So. Uh, she gave me the biggest horse laugh you ever heard. I mean, she just said, oh, yeah, I'll bet. And I said, well, I, I think Roger's sincere. I said, but I said, it wouldn't surprise me. He didn't get the, he didn't get the lens cap off the camera, you know, too excited. But anyway, we went down and, and uh, he was parked there in front of the store and uh, um, with his truck uh, and he and Gimlin and uh, they, uh, the truck had the, uh, had the saddles in and everything. The horses were not there. They were, he left them uh, there at the uh, where they were camped. And uh, he said that uh, he was concerned about his horses when we get back up there. But he, uh, we talked. Oh, I don't know how long. We talked a half, three quarters of an hour, maybe, maybe, maybe a little longer than that. And uh, he said, "Well, I'm going to have to uh, go and get the." Uh, uh, take care of the horses, get, uh, buy some groceries and there at uh, the grocery store and then go back up and, and uh, take care of the horses. He told me, however, that what he had done uh, after they uh, got the film, uh, the horse had, uh, had, had surprised the, uh, uh, this Bigfoot. He said it was, uh, must have been, he wasn't really sure, but he must have been kind of squatting down in the creek there somewhere, it was down low. And he came up over something and surprised it. And the horse scared the horse, and the horse uh, uh, shied and, and fell, uh, uh, as well as the Bigfoot was uh, uh, scared and, and moving out. But he said the horse fell, and he showed me the stirrup where the, the stirrup uh, was all bent, uh, where he fell on the, on the stirrup. And uh, so he had, uh, went uh, then, after he got the film, uh, then they uh, came out, uh, and they went out uh, to and mailed the film in Eureka. But the the way they went out, they didn't come through Willow Creek. Uh, they went down to Wichapec and turned uh, down uh, river uh, to Martin's Ferry Bridge and went over the Bald Hills Road uh, into Horik and down to Eureka and, and mailed the film uh, to his brother Yatley from uh, the main post office in Eureka, which uh, 
was at, at that time was uh, fifth and H, I believe that's correct. Fifth and H, I'm sure it was fifth and H. Before the post office, the building is still there. It's just the post, the main post office is no longer there, but the same building. But anyway, it was, it was mailed there, and then he came directly from there um, to Willow Creek and, uh, and called me. And uh, so that's a lapse time from one, that's about five, five and a half hours, isn't it? So they, from the time he got to film, I believe it was supposed to be at one o'clock, uh, so about five and a half hours elapsed time. And uh, after we left uh, him that night, then he wanted to uh, uh, know if uh, uh, Syl McCoy was around. He knew Syl McCoy and Syl had uh, um, seen some tracks in Hayfork and I'm not sure whether he had, I don't think he there when any of the tracks showed up, but he was, um, he knew Syl, they wanted to talk to him too. So at any rate, uh, uh, we got Syl's phone number for him and he called Syl and I hadn't been home very long and the phone rang, it was Syl and, and Syl asked me if I would uh, come down to the ranger station that uh, uh, he talked to uh, uh, Roger into delaying his trip back up there for a little bit and uh, one of the three of us, uh, or rather the four of us, and uh, sit down and talk a while. And so I said okay. So I went down to the ranger station and we went into one of the back offices and we, we sat there and talked a long time. I mean, and Everything that was said, I don't remember, but I do. I know we discussed uh, the film, or the, him getting the film, how he did it, and, and so forth. But all those details, I don't remember. And then, I think it was it probably was at least an hour we had uh, talked. They, they were still getting, they were getting their way late then because they were very, you know, Roger was really very concerned about the horses and wanted to get back up there. So they left and. Uh, the next thing I knew, Roger called me uh, from where I'm not really sure, but he left, he got out of the broke camp and got out. That night was a real heavy storm came in from the coast. I don't think it got this far. We really didn't get this much, but they got a, a real downpour up there in Bluff Creek. And it closed the road where they were at. They, had to, uh, they couldn't get out for the truck. So, he had seen a backhoe down the road and he went down and commandeered down and opened the road for himself and got the truck out. So he called me and wanted me to contact the owner and apologize and, and offer to pay for the use of the loader, and, which I did. And the owner was very upset that he had done this, but uh, uh, Charles Whitson owned the backhoe. But uh, at any rate, uh, that's the way they got out that night because it was really close, very, very um, bad storm. And uh, so then uh, I didn't hear, I don't know whether I ever really talked to Roger much after that or not. I think that was really just about the extent I ever talked to Roger again. Uh, I didn't talk to him, but I probably talked to him once, but I don't remember what was said. And uh, the next thing, of course, was all the, uh, all the news on the film and everything. And the, the young fellow there, Jim McLaren, was carving a statue uptown. And he, he was out backpacking at the time this happened. And, and he was very upset when he came back. And, and, and he went up to, uh, he hitchhiked to up there and saw the film. And he was very upset and he came back because the statue he had carved the statue differently had he seen the film first. So yeah, that's about the extent that I, I can tell you about the film, really. You mentioned earlier we were talking about the events leading up to it. Uh-huh. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Such as? The phone call. Well, the phone call, uh, okay, one of the things that the Roger had done, he'd asked me that I would call him if tracks showed up. Well, John Green uh, had called me then and told me that there was tracks uh, and showed up on, on Blue Creek Mountain and asked me if I would meet his chartered plane in, in Orleans and uh, uh, take him and the tracking dog and the dog hammer up to the 
uh, where the tracks were, which I agreed to do. Uh, and I met this uh, plane, and we took them up there, uh, our oldest son and I. And I, of course, I couldn't stay. I, unfortunately, I saw the tracks that night, and there was supposed to be three sets of tracks. I only saw two, but uh, I uh, had to come back. We got there just before dark. I had to come back because I had to open the store the next day, and. Uh, so they uh, tracked the dog, or the dog tracked the, uh, the beast, but uh, lost the track about 10 o'clock. And so uh, Roger had asked me to uh, call him with tracks that showed up. Well, I didn't feel right, didn't know the, uh, how Roger and John got along, I had no idea. So I hesitated to call Roger while John was still here. So I waited until John left. And then I called Roger, and he, I told him, I said, well, it's probably too late now, but uh, at any rate, I just wanted to let you know the tracks haven't been found. He said, well, he said, I've been wanting to come down anyway. I said, I think I'll go ahead and come down. So uh, uh, this was a result of him coming. It was after I made the call, and, and he said uh, that he'd come down. So that's about the extent of, uh, I think, what you're referring to. I thought I'd read somewhere where maybe John Green had called his wife himself or something and didn't get a hold of Roger at the time, left a message. I, that I, can, I couldn't say. I don't know this. I don't want to say that this isn't so. I didn't, I didn't know it. Uh, as far as I know, uh, as far as I knew, I was the reason he came down because of my call. But I couldn't swear to that maybe John didn't call him also. But you did talk to Roger himself. I did talk to Roger myself. That's right. You mentioned at the time he come to town, you had closed up the shop and had gone home for a cookout. Yeah, I just gone home. I, well, we closed the store closed at six o'clock, and so um, I might have even snuck off a little early that night. I don't know. I don't think I did, but it might have been a few minutes. You were the boss. I was the boss. I, yeah, right. You, you you went back to the store to see Roger, or did he come to your house? No, we went back to the store to see. Him. Uh, he, he didn't know the, the way to the house, and we went back down to the store to see him. He said he was there, uh, and uh, like I said, he had the um, truck with the horses, or the uh, saddles and everything, and so we went down there to see him. Did Roger ever come to your house that evening? Not that evening, no. Uh, I'm not even certain that Roger ever came to the house. Uh, you see, the thing ever was, so much my wife and I were both working. And usually, uh, uh, most of these guys showed up in the daytime and when we were at the store. So we wound up talking to them at the store, rarely talked to them at the house. And uh, there was a time that I had John Green and some, uh, I think, uh, Bob Tibbs. I'm not sure whether uh, Renee was ever there or not. I mean, we did uh, a time or two, we had a, uh, a little barbecue or something there uh, with a few of them, but I can't remember who all was there. But the night of the film, that didn't happen? No, no, it did not. Was your barbecue over when you got the call from Roger, or did you miss no, it? No, we hadn't even started. We, I was just getting the fire going. And so that night, we, we had boiled hot dogs instead of roasted hot dogs. <laughs> but, that, but that was a small matter. You know? So if anyone thought that Roger come to the barbecue that night after he got the film, that would be false? Oh, absolutely. The name of the fellow that had the backhoe, I didn't quite get that. What was his name? Charles Whitson. Charles Whitson. And uh, in fact, there's Whitson Plumbing right down here. He owned Whitson Plumbing. He's now passed away, but uh, uh, it was the fellow that owned Whitson Plumbing. You know how they spelled his name? W-H-I-T-S-O-N, I believe it was. And the mailing of the film. You touched on that. Well, uh, the film was mailed, uh, so what he told me. Now, the film, he mailed the film to his brother-in-law. Uh, and I was, I'm assuming he said Diatley. I don't know whether I knew Diatley at that time or not. I probably didn't. Uh, but mailed it to his brother-in-law uh, up in Yakima. And he mailed it from the um, main post office in, uh, in Eureka. There's been some talk about the fact that the film was taken, what, on a Friday? I believe that's correct. 
but yet on a Sunday they were watching that film. I, I don't know that. I doubt that. I, I don't know that may be true. I don't know, but I doubt that. I don't know how you get film processed that quickly, unless you happen to know a personal, uh, somebody that would personally process the film. Movie film, I think, would be much more difficult to process. I'm, I know, a, I'm not a. Uh, Photographs, uh, person. So I don't know, but I would think movie film, the very quality of it, would make it more difficult to process than, than just the 35 millimeter or something. But you can't recall at all anything Roger may have said about taking the film to someone who's expecting to process it for him. No. Never heard anything about Al Diatley having someone ready if he ever got a film. I, I don't know. I, I, I still I find that awfully hard to believe that that, that was that Sunday. I, I, I find it hard to believe that the film got up there in that length of time even. You know, I mean, the thing of it is, to me, I, I've heard him say that, that some people, and I can't remember who, some people were really concerned and felt like the, the film was flown out of the airport by a charter plane and this stuff. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, at least that that's the case. Ryder didn't tell me that. Um, and, uh, but how you would get that film up there, unless it did go by charter plane, uh, I don't know how you even got it up there that length of time. Not in those days. Uh, even airmail, particularly out of Eureka, <laughs> it wasn't uh, that, you know. So, I don't know. I, so when you say you don't think it went by charter out of the airport, is there, what's your reason for that? Uh, well, I just don't, I have no real reason, I should say that, because I, I'm not privy to any information that would give me uh, one way or another, excepting what Roger told me. So when I say that I don't believe that, that I'm really kind of stretching a little bit, because I, I have no way of knowing other than the fact that what he told me himself. And if someone told you that they were watching the film Sunday night at the UBC or at At Aldi Atley's house, I take it, um, you wouldn't be able to possibly figure out how that could have been done. No, I'd say they're full blown. I don't believe they just got their days wrong. I think so. I, I could be very wrong, but I, I don't think so. I, I, you know, I don't even know that was a Friday night. Uh, but I mean, that would be very easy to go back and check on. To see how those days fell and, and what the, the, I believe that was the 23rd of October, is that correct? I think it was. 20th. It was the 20th? I didn't remember that. But anyway, it, it, as long as you know the date, you could go back and uh, very easily to check the day, and I was assuming somebody had. I would hope some of the investigators in this field had. Yeah, I would think so. I, I just don't, I, I feel they had. This one may do that before it's over. Yeah. Now yeah. that you're mentioning it. Yeah, this is not that hard. I mean, it, it, you know, it takes a little while to do it. You uh, mentioned Roger when he came into the shop. He showed you a broken stirrup. In your opinion, Roger was pretty adamant about what he'd seen and what had happened. You don't think in any way this was something he'd done ahead of time? I, I very definitely didn't think it was something he did ahead of time. I think it was legitimate. I don't mean to say that it's not impossible that he might have done it ahead of time. How would you really know for sure? Uh, excepting for what he said. Now I do know one thing. My wife, uh, like I said, she gave me a horse lap. We went down and then when we left, after we got out left, I said, well, what do you think now? And she said, well, he either saw it or he's on the LSD, one or the other. <laughs> you know, that was when the LSD was a big thing. And so, in her opinion, he was very wound up, and mine too. I, I never found Roger, what little I knew Roger, I never found him to be terribly excitable. He was a, a rather calm man, and uh, that night he was anything but calm. Had you spoke with Gimlin that night when they come in? I, I'm sure I did, but not a whole lot more than what 
like the difference between you and John here. You know, and you're he's kind of listening and, and rather you don't a whole lot. And what was said that night um, later on with, with uh, Sil McCoy, I just don't remember. And unfortunately, sil has gone. But uh, I just don't know. I, I wish Sil was alive because you know, he could uh, help us all out a little bit. You know, with what was uh, what was said that night. But you don't remember um, Bob Gimlin talking about the creatures Adam and Leah as Roger was doing. Oh, definitely not. Definitely not. He was. Uh, I don't mean he said nothing. I don't don't think that. But I know I know he didn't talk as much as what Roger did. And didn't I hear somewhere where Roger had a limp or an injury or something? You noticed that kind of went along with the bent stirrup when he I, come I, into your I, place. Do you I, remember? Well, in the first place he didn't ever go in the store. We was it was daylight. We was outside. And we talked to outside, and uh, uh, I don't think we ever went in the store. Well, I know we didn't. And, um, but I, to say that he had a limp, I don't remember. Just don't remember. I wouldn't want to say he didn't have, but I, I don't remember that he, whether he did or he did not. But he had the presence of mind to bring that bent stirrup with him. Well, I, yeah, I, and I think that most of us would have done that. I think that I, I think I probably would. Uh, if, you know, I don't know that uh, that makes him more suspect uh, one way or the other. Really, I can say if it happened to me, I'd probably do the same thing. Is there anything you've thought of over the years that that you uh, remember of that day that you say, "Boy, I wish I had a remember to tell someone that at one time or another." Not really. I, uh, you know, I never really thought a lot about it, and, and it wasn't really. Uh, a lot of people didn't question all of what Roger did until the last few years that I recall. Nobody, uh, nobody asked me until I mean, really, very critical about it until just the last, uh, I don't know, maybe ten years, maybe a little less than that. Now, maybe I got a poor memory, I, I don't know, but I don't recall a lot of people being very critical about what, what and how that film got up there. Uh, and, and you know, the person I feel that would probably know more than anybody else as to when and how that film got developed would be John Green. I, I feel that John uh, was more on top of that, of course, than I was. And he, uh, I know John knew it. In fact, he's, I probably, and I don't know this, but I probably called John and told him that Roger got the, the uh, film. I just don't remember. Yeah, I think Bob Gimlin wasn't right with Roger when he went to mail it off, and he doesn't remember how it, where it went. I believe that Aldi Atley says he doesn't know how the film got processed, which seems kind of strange. Yeah, it does seem strange. It does seem strange. And it's led a lot of people to speculate there was some hocus pocus going on here, something phony. Even had a guy speculate the other day that Patterson must have filmed this creature at an earlier time and then took Gimlin up there and had a guy waiting, I guess, to walk in front of the camera and then He's got the film already made, and Gimlin doesn't know this, and that's how the film had already been sent out early in process, so it was ready to show by Sunday night. Well, okay, uh, let's just change this a little bit then. Is that case, then we're saying the film, film is fake. Uh, then, to me, then you go to, to uh, some people that have had some experience checking that film out, uh, namely John Green and Jeff Melvin. Uh, John Green uh, says he uh, went to uh, Disney Studios and Disney said, yeah, we could do that, providing you keep one foot in place. He said, we've got to have a place to run the wires. And uh, then uh, Jeff Melvin tells me that, okay, he can see the movement of the foot, the muscles in the foot, or how the foot flexes different than ours. 
the way it walks. And they, oh, by the way, one other thing, they also, after uh, the executive um, of Disney said they couldn't do it, he, John says, well, then what about a, a suit? Well, who could make a costume that could do this? And so uh, they said he made some phone calls and he got the, the, who he considered to be the best costume maker in Hollywood at that time over there. And he told John that, yes, I could, but it had to be skin tight. And he says, I can see muscle movement underneath there. And he says, I can't make a skin tight suit that you can do, especially that large. How could I do it? That size. And, and then Jeff, like I say, Jeff Melton then says, okay, I got foot movement of the foot. He said, I can see the movement of the foot. It, it works different than ours. You see the, the way it walks. And then Jeff has uh, uh, taken that film and has taken fly, uh, frame by frame and checked it out. And so those things make a lot of difference. And in fact, and I'm not sure now whether I'm getting this, that he got this from the uh, film, and I believe he did, but I'm not sure of this. But he said one place, he, he tells us about the beast behind. He says there's detail there that you can't possibly make in a suit. He says, is that, if that's a suit, it's not made like a pair of trousers. He says, there's detail of the, uh, the whole rear end of this beast is there. Now, to me, this is a whole different ball game than just saying, hey, how did that film get up there? I don't know how he did it. He made this film ahead of time. Then if these things that they're saying is true, then that other makes it uh, just completely mute. What's the use even worry about it? Now, if they're not true, what John and, and uh, Jeff are saying, that's something entirely different. There's one other thing I just wondered if you were going to mention I thought of is if that was the case, they'd film their adventure going up through mm -hmm. Bluff Creek sure. for his documentary, Bob on the Horse and so forth. The creature's at the end of the film. How in the hell would he get the creature filmed prior to that and then somehow did all the other filming ahead of it up to that point. That's true. Whoever says this that I just stated about that theory, I don't think has gave any thought. They just threw it out there. There's another thing, by the way, that really kicks that theory out that they would made my head of time. And I agree with what you're saying. The next spring, John Green came down here. Uh, I can't remember the job, John Green. I don't remember whether DeHinnon was there or not. Some, I don't think he was, I'm not sure. But uh, DeHinnon may have been. Also, uh, Bob Titler was there. And there were several other people, and um, myself. We all went up to the film site. John had slides of the creature and where it walked in there. John took those slides and held them up to the light, and he, he'd tell me where the, he said, Al, a little bit the other way, this way. Uh, and we could tell by depressions in the ground, by, you couldn't see them, but by with your hand underneath the leaf mold, you could find those tracks where it stepped the next year. So we know it walked right by there. We also know it walked right where it walked because he had the slides, compare it with the trees and not on the tree, a little limb here and there. So you knew exactly where it walked. So if he did make this film ahead of time, he had to make it there. It wasn't made someplace else, it was made there. There's no two ways about it. And, and like I say, I, I don't remember who all was there. I, I can't remember whether Renee was there or not. But I know that uh, John was there, and I, I'm pretty sure Bob Titmus. And there were some more fellows that were, uh, weren't as prominent in this. Uh, John Dana from down in San Diego. And I don't know who else. Um, George Hass, I think. I'm not sure. But George is getting pretty old. I'm not sure at that time whether he was able to make it up there or not. Whether he knew John, uh, George Hass or not. He had a Bigfoot newsletter he had for quite a few years. But I, I, I believe the film, I know the film was made in that location. When it was made, I don't know. But I don't see the 
it's a new problem. And particularly the fact is with what uh, John and Jeff Melvin tell me. Now, when's the first time you saw the film? John, I, I didn't go up there. So the first time I saw the film was when John Green brought it down here. And I, and I can't remember whether that was the time that the, uh, I think it probably was the next spring when John brought it down. But I didn't feel that I could afford to make the trip to uh, up there to see it. So I, the first time I saw it was brought down here. Did you ever um, see the camera? No. Well, no, wait a minute. I, I, I beg your pardon. I don't want to say I didn't see the camera. I don't remember if I saw the camera or not. Did you ever sell him film? No. Well, I understand one thing about this, that that camera was rented. That it wasn't his cameras. So probably I wouldn't have seen it the first time. If he'd had it before, unlikely I wouldn't have seen it anyway. <coughs> If you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.